plan for this webinar. Recording. Rough plan for this webinar is to take an asset that I've already made. I've already prepared an asset um, that I modeled, uh, and I'm going to be texturing that in Substance Painter. Uh, and then I'm going to be bringing that into Unreal, creating materials, and then we're going to be creating a uh, working security system uh, with blueprints. So the model itself is a uh, security camera, kind of a sci-fi-ish that I modeled specifically for this purpose. So I'm going to be looking at that. All right. So we're going to switch over to Substance Painter. So this is our, our mesh that we're going to be working with today. It's only got two textures that we're going to be making, or two materials rather that we're going to be making, and uh, it's split into two pieces so that the model can kind of actuate and move around. Uh, we can kind of bring it to life and make it more interesting. So uh, we're going to be working on a little bit of a base layer. I like to kind of work with something that's a little bit metallic and kind of set up this in different layers so that we can do a lot of weathering effects and stuff like that. And Usually when I do, I, I, I do one of the, uh, the Substance Painter courses at the school overall as well, uh, which is why I wanted to, uh, to include this in today's webinar, because it's a lot of fun to do. So I like to uh, work with an object in the sense of like bringing it a lot of history, because um, that's one of those aspects that you might commonly overlook when you're making assets yourself, and it, and it really, really brings things to life when you do that. So I think I'm going to start with some rough steel. Yes, we have like a basic material here. We're going to tinker around with that overall. And we're going to set up a couple of masks and prepare the model for different effects that we'll be able to do directly in Unreal later on. So uh, first thing I'm going to do actually before we start texturing this properly is a little process in uh, Substance Painter. Let's actually redo a couple of things here. Do we have, right, here we go. We're gonna go to our baking settings right now. We're gonna make sure that we have 2048 output size for everything. Uh, I'm gonna switch off ID and I'm gonna make sure that we can do ambient occlusion. Does anyone here not know what ambient occlusion is? By the way, it's always with these things, you never know how much people know overall. Uh, let's see, just going to change these settings that we have. Turning off self occlusion for anything other than, than this, because we don't want ambient occlusion on parts that are going to be moving, because uh, it'll look really weird in that case. So these settings are done. Let's bake out our base maps. Now, if you don't know, uh, in Substance Painter, um, these base maps are kind of used as the base data for a lot of the procedural generation when it comes to making interesting looking textures. So we have a whole bunch of information that we can go through now that's baked into the model. We have our, our normals right now that doesn't have anything because this is only a low poly mesh, but we do have our say world space normal, which is a colorized or color normalized version of whatever direction every single surface is actually pointing in. Um, we also have the ambient occlusion, which is kind of like where I like to define it as where light goes to die, um, because it's basically where light will get trapped. And so it never actually reaches your eyes overall. So you get this kind of like slightly darker areas, which, uh, light never seems to get into. Uh, we have a curvature map, which basically is just, you know, how, uh, harsh a curve is, whether it's, you know, convex or concave. And uh, we have our position map, which again is a, a normalized uh, bit of colorized data, which basically says like how far into the world uh, things go. And we also have our thickness map, which allows us to see stuff like, you know, if, if we were making, say, a translucent material, this would be very important because then you would actually have uh, defining uh, how much light can actually penetrate through different surfaces. And uh, yeah, so that's that's our base materials that we're going to be working with. So let's just get into it and see if we can make this thing look interesting. Now, I like to use a little bit of triplanar projection. Uh, so that means we kind of have a box around it and we kind of project all that material onto the box. Let's change that tiling maybe a little bit. That's actually fine the way it was. 
So I like to have a base coat on things. And I think I'm going to use the same base coat for the, uh, the details here. So we're going to use that. Let's use triplanar. There we go. Now we are going to switch out a lot of elements and kind of mask them in based on what we need. And in this case, I think what we'll want to do is create a couple of folders. So I'm going to call this our base material right here. And I'm actually going to put the steel into it. And I'm going to create a mask for this. I'm going to create a white mask, which means that everything is included in the mask. And I just have to color certain elements to exclude them from the uh, model. So I'm going to go to, uh, let's see, we're going to use the UV chunks and I'm going to set that to black. And first off, obviously this is supposed to be a security camera, so we don't want our metal material on our lens. And we also want these, let's see, that's another, right. That's on the details. Let's actually hide those. So we know which parts we're actually working on here. I think. This part, we're going to add another mask for that later on. Uh, let's see, these three are going to be buttons that we're going to be using. So we're going to have a little bit of, you know, illumination on them. Should be pretty good. I think this part should be maybe something a little bit more plasticky. Sticking out, so that should be fine. And I think we'll handle some kind of painted element for a lot of the other stuff separately. I think this piece on the side here should be some kind of plastic material. We can kind of play around with that a little bit later. So we're going to split that off. Let's make sure we can actually see what we're working with here. That should be good. Great. Oh, cool. Um, let's see now. Let's split these off too. Make them a bit more interesting. All right, so then we have our base material. Now I'm gonna set up a couple of more of these. So we're gonna set up another folder. Let's call this uh plastic detail. And this one, we're going to do the opposite. So I have a black mask and I'm going to do a fill for this one. We can actually add in a uh, fill layer. I'm just going to make this like a red color just so we can kind of see where, where we're working right now. Let's do that for this piece. That's just about everything. I'm just gonna refine the other one. Notice I missed the back and the underside. Okay, so that's looking good. Pretty good. And I'm going to do another folder called camera. So do a black mask for that. And I'm going to add in just these parts. And we do need a fill layer there so we can actually see what's, what's going on. Let's make this one blue. To clear the mask because I was a little too hasty there. Bring that in there. And I will have another folder just for the lens. Same thing there. So this one is going to be probably green. I like using these kind of neon colors with this stuff because it makes it very easy to differentiate what we're actually doing. So there we go. And let's see. These ones are just going to be like kind of a chrome material overall. I think I'll make another folder for them. Just call that like, I don't know, front. Details. Do another fill. 
Let's do this one as a purple color, the black mask, and we'll just fill in these two pieces. All right, cool. So now we sectioned off uh, this part of the model. Let's do the same thing with the, uh, the other details overall. Now these cables back here are gonna be a lot of fun because we're gonna have to make them kind of more like a rubber material going off. And then I was thinking maybe some kind of capacitor back here. Um, the overall arm that's holding up the camera is gonna be something metallic. And I was thinking of having these side bulges as kind of indicator lights for like, that uh, could be an informative element in gameplay when, which says like, oh, this camera is active. So we have like some kind of glowing light on it uh, in that sense. So let's create another folder here and that's gonna be our base metal. I'm gonna put our steel into that one. And we're gonna do the same thing here. So we're gonna do a white mask and I'm going to remove these elements and these elements completely. There we go. I think those elements should be fine like that. Let me know if I'm moving too fast. If people are not keeping up. Let's do a cables one. Do another fill there. Let's make that one red. Be fine. Uh, do a black mask. Let's go in these two cables. We have some blue light on the screen. Maybe someone speaking. Yes. I just want to see. Do we have some blue line on the screen? So I'm not sure if only I'm seeing it. Seeing it. The hell is going on there? I can send a screenshot if you want. <laughs> no, I see it. I see it. I think some short is short uh, uh, drawing over the screen. I'm going to annotation, clear all drawings. Okay. There we go. Did somebody draw on the screen? That's interesting. All right. Well, it's capacitor. Capacitor. And green black mask these parts and uh let's see i think the outer edges of these uh indicators right here should be fine actually might share a little bit of material with the base uh material that we'll be working with so i think i'm going to create another folder and we're going to share something across the two materials and we're going to use a black mask that and I'm just gonna add in a temporary one, make that blue, and we're going to add in these elements. We don't want that. Add that in, and then we're probably going to have to go and take all of these elements out a little bit here, just so we can mask it out. go that looks good and let's see i'm probably gonna have to use a inverted element for the um indicator on the side there same thing here Come out again. and then let's just exclude the uh the centerpiece
Oh, evidently, I had a little bit of mess up there. I'm going to have to add these other elements in manually. Sorry about that. There. Okay. I think I don't have ignore backspace now. No. Okay. There's something happening with, happening with your sound, sound. for me. With my what? With your sound, with those. I was saving automatically, so it's an auto save. Okay. It, unless my sound is screwed up now. No, it's okay. No, it's okay. Okay. Side details and let's add in i'm gonna copy this mask so let's see where do we have the copy mask there we go copy mask let's add in another bit and then we'll call this indicator light and we'll do a fill for that let's make this like kind of pale green and we're going to paste into mask and I would like to invert that mask. And we're going to remove all the other elements. Okay, so I think we prepped all our basic materials here. So we're going to go ahead and add in the rest of the camera body here. Now, what I'd like to do, I think, is to make these elements actually match up. So we can probably use uh, this bluish element. Can probably be the uh, the base base material as well, unless we want to do something uh, interesting with that. So I'm actually going to instantiate this, which means that I basically copy that information over to another material. So now that we have instantiated it, I want now instantiated. There we go. Base material instance. Uh, let's see, that needs to be not that version of it. We shouldn't do the, uh, the actual folder. That should be the uh, subfolder I think within our folder. So we'll do that as in base instance. I'm gonna move our roughness over there so that the mask for this is basically controlled globally in that sense. So we're just gonna instantiate this so we can clear whatever that's gonna be using. So we'll do that over to our details. There we go. We can put this element down in our base material so that we are we can remove that one and we're kind of sharing this material over it so i'm going to close that up and we're going to do side details it's going to be in there as well so we should do that and we're not going to do anything particular with that right now so we should hopefully use the uh, the same element right there, which I believe I had not masked out. So that should be interesting there. Okay. Um, just trying to think about what we can do there. Let's actually have just going to do a little trick here just so we can add in that that mask. So we're going to add in a mask anchor. 
And with the mask, I think we're going to add a fill and we're going to reference that. So we're going to just add that in. It should be fine. So now we have both masks in there and it should be fine. So this is our base coat right now. So let's start working on what we can do with this in our base set here. Since we've got our steel rough, I think we want to have some kind of more colored elements so that we actually do a little bit of paint on that. So what we're going to do is we're going to add another fill layer on top of that. Right now, that's just going to be like this kind of matte material. And we could do this as, as just a colored element. The tricky thing here is that we want to add in a little bit of masking elements. So I'm going to go to our smart masks and we're going to see what we can get here. So we can think kind of a, an edge wear, something along those lines, just to get it nice. We can try that one. All right, I like the look of that. I think that's really cool. I want to invert it though. Just to kind of add in a little bit of grunge to it. Pretty good overall as a base material. Increase the contrast. Just tinker around with these settings a little bit so we get something that looks okay. And I think we'll be doing a little bit of like extra paint on top of this uh, overall. But I think I think that looks okay for now. Um, let's work on the plastic pieces here. And I think we might have some good base material. To Plastic. We've got greeny plastic. That could be something. Uh, glossy plastic base materials. Let's try greeny plastic. I'll try planer. Try green that. Kind of works. It's not exactly the kind of color that we think we want overall. Oh, uh, let's see what we can do here. Something that might look a little bit interesting. Be a red plastic box or something. Be best to keep it like a gray tone. All right. So now that we have that greeny plastic right there, let's also add in a little bit of weathering on that as well. So. I'm not going to spend too long working on this. Like I probably would have spent like half a day just texturing this thing to make sure it looks really, really awesome. So I'm going to skip uh, a little bit of what I would normally do overall, just to make it so that we, we can move on to Unreal finally today. Um, all right, so that actually looks pretty good. Keep it like that. Grungy, contrast. I kind of like, really like the look of that overall. And I think actually we might want to use that same one for these details. Not quite sure yet, but let's move on to the next element and see what we can do. It's probably going to be these details before we actually move on to the camera lens. So I think on details, let's do the same thing there, but here we want something that's kind of really, really, really shiny. Good. Yeah, pretty good.
what I did right now was just drop in a, a smart material, which is kind of like a pre-made collection of layers that you can kind of stick into something already, um, which tends to speed up quite a bit what you're working with. I'm going to find out where the dirt is so we can actually play with that a little bit. Right. All right, that should be okay, I think. Unless we want to do something. I think I think they'll stick with those actually for the front details. I'm gonna close that off so we have that. And that let's do the actual camera itself. Now for this one I think I want something more like um kind of like gunmetal. And I think I already have a good uh smart material for that specifically. change the lighting I think in order to actually see what we're doing here but let's actually go to the base color here so that you can just see it sponge and we've got our base let's just bring that up a bit not too much Okay, I've just encountered a little bug in uh, Substance Paint. Probably that won't be too disruptive. Okay, so I'm going to have to restart Substance Painter right now. Just give me a moment. Uh, all right, should be back. Okay, I think. Also noticed that this uh, piece right here does not have the uh, masking. Side detail. And, uh, that's under the base body material. And let's see. Plastic detail, that's the one. There we go. All right, so let's do the lens. Let's do something really, 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 really shiny for that. I think we can actually do a shiny plastic or something like that. Should be good. It's not going to be translucent anyway. It's just going to be like super shiny uh, edge piece that we're going to be using there. I think we'll just try with that. Near black, but it's going to be just very, very shiny. Here we 
Give your nothing. Something like that. All right. Um, let's move on to some extra details here. Let's actually do the cables as well. Let's try for a. I think this one might work. Either plastic fabric bands or cables braided. That try that and see how that's working. Oh. Pretty shiny cables. Um, let's see what we've got here. Something more like that. I wonder if we have any cool settings for this with the actual pattern or something like that. That would be really interesting. Six. Red and black. Unless we want to do something a bit more dynamic. I'm just going to try around here and see what actually looks good. That does look pretty nice to me. Stitches. Pretty rough. And let's make the reddish cable, maybe something like that. Let's see, that's the stitches if we are going to use them. I don't think we are. Kind of like that overall, actually. Ten. Yeah, if we do like a full screen view there, I think that looks pretty good. Um, let's see what other details are we looking for here. So we'll do with the plastic box a little bit there. We're gonna do a lot of like little extra normal details and stuff like that. Let's see how much time we have. We've already been going for 40 minutes. Shit. Okay. Let's see. Yep, it's 40 minutes. I need to step up my game here. All right, cool. But we're gonna have time for everything else. Leave some time for questions and answers. Oh yeah, absolutely. All right. So I do apologize if if this ends up looking less stellar than I had originally intended because it's gonna be a bit of a rush job. Um, let's see. Let's just do the capacitor. It's like kind of a, on like a green painted steel or something like that. Let's add in a uh, buff metallic layer and we'll do a painted layer on top of that. Steel. Try, try playing the projection. Looks great. Let's do stink painted steel on top of that. Let's make this kind of a darkish green color. That uh, we need to have this a bit more glossy. A little bit of damage there as well. No controls for shininess. Yep, there it is. Right, there we go. Oh, 
still not plugged. Should be fine. And of course, the indicator lights. Now, these ones are actually going to be just like kind of a plain matte plastic. So I'm actually going to use the just the uh, the matte. There's plastic. something coming with your sound. It's like okay. We can. Is it constant? But it's interrupted every two seconds with some distortions. I don't know if there's anything that I can do about it. Okay, now unfortunately. Okay, hopefully. Okay. No. And in order to get that properly set up as well, I need my texture set settings. Because right now, by default, we don't have any emissive, so I'm going to have to add that in. Just for those details, I'm going to make sure to do that for the other one as well. We need emissive details. So right now, when it comes to our plastic mat, I would like the emissive right there. And I'm just going to do this, turn that up. But that is actually uh, lit. Now, this this isn't what it's going to look like when we're actually in Unreal. Obviously, we're not doing this up in a cool way. But uh, that's just going to show it as a, as a white color on a mask, basically. Uh, we're going to do the same thing with these three buttons. Kind of add in a little bit more interesting detail here. Now, I don't think I had previously masked out these three buttons. So we're going to do buttons and I'm just gonna add these in with a mask. Or do fill layer just so we can see what we're working with. Now, a particular thing I'm gonna do with these uh, three buttons here is I'm going to add in a paint layer that we're gonna be using. So we're gonna be painting over uh, these details. So I'm still gonna be painting this but what i'm going to be doing is i'm going to be painting uh three different colors so i'm actually going to be disabling those i'm going to paint red color on one button and i'm going to go with pure blue make sure we actually have that uh, set up here oh, Using RGB rather, so I got more control there. So one's going to be completely blue, and then one's going to be completely green. Right here. Now, this is going to end up being quite interesting. I think. Big question here is: Was I able to paint with? Ah, I did that wrong. I was meaning to paint with the emissive. Specifically, that layer. Let's see. Okay. You know, to paint with emissive. Uh, am I going to have to do this in a different way? I might have to do a fill layer just for that. All right, okay, so let's do that then. So we'll do full red and we will add a black mask to that. And this one in. And here. Emissive color should be red. We did the uh, actual layer. There we go. So there we've got our green. The red, the red, green, 
do our full green on that one. Add a black mask. And we'll do another one that is blue. And do full blue. There. Now we don't need these to have any particular color other than like white or the uh, the base colors and stuff like that. So I'm going to make sure to do that. So what I'm actually doing here with the the emissive channel is when we render out all the textures of when I import into Unreal, this will actually be a, a, a colorized emissive map, which means that we have a mask for all of those, and I can use the individual colors in order to do different effects. So I can pick out what area, whatever. So I'll be able to take these buttons. I'm going to be able to make like one shines constantly and maybe one blinks or, you know, something along those lines. Uh, it should be a nice little detail. Let's see that there's a little polygon right there that we need to fix. Indicator light. There we go. Hopefully no more issues there. But the indicator light overall, that's just going to be white. So I'm not going to really going to care about what it looks like in terms of the, uh, the overall look, because we'll be able to change that quite a bit. All right. So I think we're almost there. Let's just add an overall a kind of rust layer for the metal and maybe a little bit of paint. And then we should throw everything into Unreal. So I'm going to be using a filter. Thing. Here. up on the top as well. So this is kind of one of those procedural elements that we have where we can just kind of add in a little bit of rust. Change around these details. We're going to change out the varnish scale. And let's make it so that, you know, we have some interesting details there. bigger than we want it to be. This will just be a very subtle detail. All right, ahead of that, I think what we can do is we can toy around with just the colorized elements. Let's see if we can get something more interesting looking overall. Let's see, let's make this camera maybe some kind of teal color or something like that. Or we can probably stick to like a dark gray, which isn't that all that exciting, but it'll probably match the environment quite well. We need to increase the wear and tear level just a little bit to make it a little more interesting. That's also going to affect how our um, rust is going to be developing, so we're going to have to tinker with that a little bit. There we go. Um, let's see. Don't know if we have time for any more elements there. Actually, I think I spent too much time with this. Normally what I would do now is also go over a whole pass of 
uh, normal details like screws and, and uh, stickers and stuff like that to actually add in uh, more interesting details overall. I think we're gonna have to be call it good for now. Yeah, you have half an hour still. Yeah. And so, then we'll get to Q and A's. Yeah. So we're gonna have to do that. So I'm gonna put this on uh, work webinar and we'll do Unreal Engine 4 just getting all those things out and we're going to have to export all the textures all right cool hopefully that should be good looking at the textures right now everything looks okay so we're going to save this and we're going to have to open up Unreal Engine. So I've got this little scene right now, which we're going to be working with. I'm going to be putting up the camera. So I'm just going to go ahead and import everything that we have. The general advice when you're importing models is to have convert scene unit in there as well. So you get everything at the right scale. So there we go. Just gonna check over our textures. These are our uh, ambient occlusion, uh, roughness and metallic maps. It's important to set these to masks so that they are calculated correctly. Otherwise everything's gonna look super weird. Uh, let's open up the other one. All right, so let's create a quick material for that. Or actually, we already have the materials, but we just need to add in uh, the right things. So we've got details, we've got camera body. So we're gonna have arm details. You can see, this is camera body. Let's pull in all those textures there. So we'll connect this up to base color. And that's gonna be our, our lights. And we have our normal, and then we have ambient occlusion, roughness, and metallic. And this is obviously going to be our emissive. So let's do something really quick there. I would like a three color blend. I'm not sure what we, we should do this in a good way. Um, Let's do one button here. We'll multiply that by a color. I'm going to set this basically to like say a, a yellow color overall. So we're going to set that there. Multiplying just the red color, which means that we're taking the the red color information in this texture, which is one of those uh, little buttons. I'll be hooking that up here, so we should see it pop up. Uh, it's kind of yellow. Yeah, there's like a dull, dull yellow. We need to multiply this um, so we have an intensity. Uh, create a value here. Going to be so, and we'll set that like twenty. There we go. So now you can actually see that it's it's kind of glowing right there. So that's our first element. Now I'm going to do the same thing but we're going to add two elements together. So we're going to add this, and then we're going to do exactly the same thing here. We're going to multiply, but we're going to do the, the green layer in this case. And we're going to do a different color in this case. We're going to do like a red button like that. Yes, I know, a red button using the, the green color information. It's going to be fun. So I'm going to add a time element here, and I want to have this kind of like subtly flashing and off. Um, so I take a sign and we're going to multiply these two together. Multiply that, we're going to add that, and then there. Okay. Now we should have one light that's flashing red, just using a little bit of math. And uh, the last button, I think we can also do some. Instant color information. 
off the lake. Uh, let's do like a kind of a nice little blue color. And um, we'll do a multiply here. And add that in. And we will also add these together again. Add this, and this, and this. Um, yeah. There, and we got a nice constant blue. I know that doesn't look like much because it's just the material laid out the way it is, but I'm I'm pretty happy with that right now. I'm gonna need to make the other one. So uh, base color. And this is our should be our missive. Yes. Of information. Great. Just looked weird. Um, let's see our normal and our ambient occlusion, our roughness, our metallic. And then let's do another multiply. This let's do a three color vector. I kind of want this to be something that we can control later on. So we'll see if we have time. To do that out. Um, multiply this again, and then add in a single element fail, so this will be our missive string. Be too much, but let's see. Right, so that's the materials. Now let's actually make a blueprint for these meshes right now so we're going to make an actor blueprint we're going to call this uh security camera underscore uh, ap and we're going to be adding in this is this mesh so they'll be in the uh the right position and we can kind of see this element something seems to have gone a little bit weird with this emissive texture here. I'm not quite sure what happened there. It might have been something with uh how it came out in the end. By the way, we got the lights on the side and you can see how they're flashing around. So what we're gonna do with these is we're gonna add in a little bit of code so that they can kind of move around and stuff. And we're also just gonna be adding in an element of, uh, let's see how much time we have. Still have half an hour, right? Yes. Piotr. Yes. yes. We don't have to be so strict, you know, but uh, let's save some time for Q and A. Yeah, I know. I just really wanted it to look better than it does. This kind of looks like crap to me. But, uh, all right. It should be fine. I just don't know what the hell is going on with this uh, emissive texture, but I don't think I have time to, uh, to debug it right now. Something weird. Really, really weird. Something with the... Yeah, okay, there we go. Some weird missing information on that. I think I just need to fix the uh, the material sampler there. So we can see on that. The masks, do that one. Okay, there we go. Now it's now it's shipping up correctly. So let's increase the uh, emissive string. Like 50 or something. Um, that looks nice and menacing, doesn't it? Yes, it looks nice. Oh, cool. All right. So now we're going to be digging into a little bit of code uh, with whatever time we have left. And we'll see how fast I can do this. Uh, if we want to keep it going for a little while, um, stuff like that then that's fine. I can always keep expanding this a bit. So we only have our two basic elements right here now. 
And just as to visualize things, I'm going to add an arrow component to this just so we can kind of see how things are, are pointing, right? Because ideally, what we want to do is actually have this be an active element in our environment. So we can kind of place it out and then it actually behaves in a security camera, like a security camera. And what we want to do um, with that is we want to, one, we want to make it uh, able to actually see. Right, so we want it to be able to be something like you can have a monitor somewhere and you can have what the camera actually sees be transmitted to a monitor that you can actually look at as a player. Two, we want to have it be able to move around so we can actually have it kind of on a preset track and with a little bit of settings and stuff like that. Um, and three, I think we want to also have it be able to detect the player and maybe even sound an alarm or something like that if you were doing like a, like a stealth game. So those are the things that we're going to be trying to do. So I think we should start with having to have it actually move around a little bit, though. But we could also add in the, uh, the actual camera element of it. But I think uh, the best way we can do this is to kind of add in some kind of a, a spline element to actually track a position or something like that. That might be a bit like complex, but I think it could be really cool to do. We're gonna try and do that. So we'll do a spline as a component. So spline is just a three dimensional line and we can kind of move those around. What I'd like to do with this one is just to have it like kind of ping pong between uh, two locations. Uh, in that sense, which is just going to be along the spline with, with a timeline and then have the camera actually look at that position and just kind of like move back and forth and stuff like that. So what the spline allows us to do is to make that more dynamic, right? So we could actually make it so that like it can view going around a corner uh, rather than just turning in a flat rate. So uh, it's going to be really interesting to set up. All right, so the first thing we want to do is we want to set up the actual camera control for this. And I think what we want to do is I'm going to set up some kind of a marker. It's the scene element right now which is going to be our target marker. And then we're just going to have it follow that element. Let's see. We do want the body to be attached to the arm. We have our spine, but we have it. Great. So let's set up a little bit of controls for this. So what we want to do is we want to figure out where our target is in relation to our base. That's basically going to be verbatim where the target position is, and then basically we'll move the target along the spline uh, for simplicity's sake. So we're going to get relative uh, location for our target right here. And I don't know how to get. To get. Relative location, we want that, and we want our default scene route. Rather, like we want to calculate this. Let's do a so uh, eight and two calculation. So I want to get our relative location, and I want to split this so that we have our x and we have. Y locations. So let's see if this produces the right result. So X and our Y location, we want to take our camera arm and then we want to set uh, relative rotation. And let's actually do this in a super, super simple way. So set our Z rotation based on where our target is. Compile that. We're going to test it. 
So if we've got our target, all right, so we almost have it working. It's just a little bit backwards there. So we're just going to flip right to those values. I think it's going to be my X and my Y. Okay. Uh, there we go. Okay, so now it's actually be able to follow our target just with a little bit of math. And that doesn't matter like where we go, like up and down and stuff like that. It'll be able to follow that for me. So it turns the entire mechanism. The second thing we want to do is just to have this piece, the actual camera piece, just be able to look up and down depending on where that target is in, in relation to it. So we're going to do exactly the same thing there. So we're going to have our target location and let's see if we make this a little bit cleaner. So we're going to do set relative location and we're going to take our body. In this case, I think the rotation that we're looking at is the, yeah, it's the Y axis. That's the one we want to do. So we have our Y axis. Let's do the same thing here. Uh, relative location, that's going to be our probably our X and our Z, and we'll use that as our position. Let's see how that works. Okay, so we have our target here. Sorry? Somebody speaking? But they unmuted, but it's a... Yeah. All right, so that seems to be working okay. the most part. I think this is not updating uh, perfectly, so we might have to fix a little bit of the math there. I think it's, uh, yeah, 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 right. We need relative location, and we need the rotation of the camera arm. Let's do our target. We get the relative location there. And we're going to have to, I think we're going to unrotate vector based on that. And we'll split this and do the same thing here. There we go. That's looking perfect. No problem. That means we'll be able to run this target along the uh, the track with kind of a timer, and we'll be able to uh, have the camera kind of follow things. Beautiful. All right. So now that that works, we have to package this part as a function. Uh, so right now it's just running in our construction script, which is a great place for, for uh, running initial details, especially with testing stuff. So I'm going to throw all of this into a function that we can use. So I'm going to select all of this and I'm going to collapse to a function. So that's going to be uh, update so our construction script is still going to be running this, this function, but now we're actually going to make it run with active code. So what we'd like to do here is to basically, I think what we can do is have it run a um, timeline or run it, I think. No, I should actually run it with a timeline. I think that'll be best timeline. I'll call this camera track. Delete all the other elements. So we want this to we actually don't even need the begin play event here. So we're going to need this to loop and we want this to play by itself so we don't have any input on it whatsoever. And I'm going to add a float track, which is going to be our line progress. 
And all that's going to do if I add in some keys, get time zero, um, five seconds, maybe too much, but let's do 10 seconds, perhaps. And then we'll do five seconds, add that at a value of one. We'll add in another key at 10 seconds with a value of zero. And we'll click these and kind of make them a little bit more preferred so we get like a very smooth kind of curl going on. So that should be enough information for us to actually update our camera in this case. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our target, we're going to take our spline, and we're going to get um, location. Let's see. Get location at time it should be good because our spline has this duration right here that we can set and so since the number that we have is from zero to one we should be able to use that as a progress location to actually move our target and then update our code a little bit here so we'll do our spline progress hook that up uh we'll use a constant velocity and yeah that should be fine and we'll also use our update camera function. So we'll that just set station like that as part of our update. And then we'll hook that up into our update overall. Now that should be enough code. See how much time we actually have that. Cool, we're making good pro progress here. All right, so we have our blueprint right now. So let's actually bring that into the world. So we're going to set that up like kind of, um, let's see, somewhere in this corridor, I think. Set it up so we have it uh, kind of near a wall over here. Sitting, I think we have to. Change this snapping just a little bit just to make it sit right there at the ceiling. Something like that should be good. And now we should be able to select the, uh, the spline for this. And we get down to like the floor area. And I think we should be able to just change that so that we look like okay so we're looking over here on the floor and we kind of want this camera to like look around on both sides and when we play so i'm going to run a simulate here which means we're not starting with the player we just want to have it running on its own just so we can kind of test how things are going we want to see what location do we have right now. Okay. okay. So something's happening, but it seems to be running a little bit too fast. So I think we need to do just a little bit of debug here. I might have uh, lagged out a little bit there because it was uh, probably saving in the background. Okay. Let's try, I'm going to try and see if we can just debug this a little bit just in the construction script to make sure that we know exactly what's going on here. So I want to go to the construction script and want to let's hook this up right now so we run this code and i want to be able to make this into a variable so something is going wrong with the actual target Target is ending up in the wrong position. Okay. 
So um, let's see what we're trying to do about that. Let's try changing it to world. Okay, okay, okay. So that seems to be working. Okay, cool. So in that case, debug that now. Let's test it again. And it's still all right. I did not change the uh, setting here. Let's try setting this to world. Let's try it right again. Okay, so something is clearly not working exactly the way it should. It's sort of working, it's just not working exactly right. I wonder why that is. All right, so we might have to rework some of the math that we're using right now. So I think what we want to do is, instead of trying to use relative locations, let's just use the world location for everything. So we'll get our uh, location. Location instead of uh, relative location. We'll split that new x and y, and we have our doing that same thing here. We'll recombine these. Get world location. And we'll use that one instead. It's working properly. Okay. Well, seems promising. So there we have that. Um, let's see, now that would be based on our world location there. So we can't use relative location there. So we set the world location. Instead, just so we don't have any uh, localized mass issues. And we'll need to do the same thing for this. There, why again checking it in the viewport, make sure that this is working properly, and that is absolutely not working properly. Okay, so maybe this one should be relative in that case. Is working here. Big question is whether or not it's working here. So it seems to be like sort of working still. Sort of not working. I think the problem here is like if we had it all relative and we had it set up the way we did before and I just rotated the spline, it would have probably been better. So let's just revert it to those settings um, just for simplicity's sake. Otherwise it would have had to do a whole bunch of debugging in order to uh, figure this out, I think. Really tricky to get it working otherwise. We do have it working here.
down. And uh, a little. All right, the issue there is relative location, maybe. So let's actually set set location instead of relative location. Update. And I think we want to get. Okay. Set it like this and use our spline. Dictator spline. Let's see if that will actually make it work. So that is not right, right. Right. Just off the location. This. So we're going to have to do this minus our actor location to actually get that working properly, and then we're going to have to get it right. Otherwise, the math is going to be all over the place. So we need this minus our actor location. Let's split that, and we don't need to split it. Go. Okay. Now is it gonna work properly? Well, all right. At least it's pointing somewhat in the right direction now. Let's see. Okay. Yes. It is actually working properly now. Fantastic. Cool. All right. We've got a little bit worried there. Let's see how much time we have left. We have a few minutes left, so let's just set up the actual camera view from the camera now and make it so that it can actually see and we can kind of update a texture with this. So I'm going to use the actual mesh body here and I'm going to add a component. Let's make a scene capture component. That's just going to be scene capture component 2D. It shows up as a big camera, um, which is actually full on correct. Uh, I need to create a texture for this. So we have a render target. This is going to be our camera view. Now, if I were making this a full system for a game, I would make this to be like a much more dynamic element and it would be a whole system interconnected. So we can do some cool stuff with it. Um, let's make this 1024 by 1024. Our actual camera view right here. Now I'm going to try and put this on the side over here and zoom out so we can actually see how this might update uh, when we've actually got it hooked up. So this is going to be our camera view and we're going to have to do a couple of things to set this up properly. One thing is that it's going to have to ignore the, uh, the mesh itself. So, um, let's see. Oh. Flags, I think everything here should be fine. I think we want to actually have it generate um, using all the information in the scene overall. Um, I do think we want uh, to see. Okay. 
use the show only list. I would rather have it use the, um, the inverse of it. So I think actually what we can do is just use the render scene primitives and then we just kind of move the camera so that it matches up right about where the camera is. So we don't have the, uh, the mesh of the camera itself kind of popping in the way right there. I'll move it to just about. Just about there where the lens is. Oh, um, our field of view should actually be really constrained. So I think it's actually going to be like the 45 degrees. So now we have a camera view right here. So we're going to see if we can move around the target point a little bit. Doesn't seem to be updating right now, but when we hit play, you can now see that the camera is actually generating a texture, which is now the actual view from the camera as it's kind of moving over the environment. And, uh, that ends up being pretty cool, I think, overall. The camera's moving a little bit fast for, for what we need it to do, but um, that, that's going to be fine. All right, so we'll pause that. And at the very, very, very least, I think we could look at um, what's going on there with our movement, just to make that a little bit nicer. I think we can do a little bit of adjustment just with our camera track, just so it kind of spends just a little bit longer right there in the middle. Can we kind of plot that out? Actually, let's add in another key here just so we get like value of one and we'll do like a not really the ends that's the issue though, is it? It's kind of like the midway point right here. We kind of want it to, to kind of just slow down here a little bit. That might look super weird when we're actually doing it. Um, let's see, do I have the camera view up? Do more from that. Uh, not perfect, but it's a little bit better at least. It's just slowing down just a little bit too much. Now, what I would absolutely do um, with something like this is I would run the entire texture through like an image processor and stuff like that. We don't necessarily have time for that. Um, but the last thing I'll do, if you just give me two minutes. Yeah, but, but just I didn't want to interrupt you just to make it smooth. You just continue and I ask people to uh, participants to give questions in the chat so you can continue your work. And I would just read out loud. So. Okay. We need just to... sure we can i can answer questions while while doing this yeah so guys you are you are free to ask questions to tommy while he's finishing his work you can either write in the chat or just unmute yourself yeah go ahead and ask questions here Right. Um. 
Any questions at all so far? Not yet. Okay. It's pretty self-explanatory, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> That's fantastic. I was worried I was moving way it's too fast. From, from Camille. I would like to mm -hmm. know what you think about developing games in Unity. As I'm, as I'm software developer, so I have closer, so I am closer to the code than to the mode developing. Well, um, personally speaking, I have never ever claimed to be partial when it comes to what game engine you're using. In my opinion, uh, Unity is a subpar engine compared to, to Unreal. I think Unreal is a much better engine. Uh, you have much more tools to use straight out of the box and you have way more things you can do with it. And it's a lot easier to make things look really awesome. Uh, Unity, you have to start from scratch. Now, there is a benefit to starting from scratch with, with an engine like Unity, which is that you have full absolute control over every single detail, right? But I kind of think it, think of this in the way of like a, um, the difference between a, a regular screwdriver and electric screwdriver, right? Like with a regular screwdriver, you have full control over exactly how much force you're putting in when you're, when you're trying to screw something in, but you do have to do all of the work yourself. Now with an electric screwdriver, you can put it in and then just run in the screw. Um, it's really fast and you get it done really quickly and efficiently. And that's what I compare these engines to, I would say. Okay. Even I got it. Here's a question from Elefteria. How much time do you believe someone needs to learn to operate Unreal Engine? Shockingly short amount of time, actually. Uh, if you want to get started uh, doing things actively and you want to like make your own little games and stuff like that, um, as long as you're willing to put in the work uh, and really understand the engine and, and with that said, I know ex I, I know exactly how daunting it is. I've been teaching Unreal for many, many years. Uh, I know exactly how scary it is to open up Unreal for the first time. Uh, if you can get past that, and really I, I would urge that you do, that you at least try it. Um, my advice there is don't panic. You know, it, it's okay. You're going to make mistakes. You're not going to get everything on time. And you should not expect to understand everything, everything the first time you're using it. And just because you don't you know understand it right off the bat doesn't mean that you're not going to overall right? these are complicated things and it takes time to learn them but that said you can learn uh the basics of unreal and start doing cool things i think within weeks that's how long you need to start going essentially right because if you're using the blueprint scripting system um you already have everything halfway there, right? It's a scripting system that is almost as powerful as using C++ in native in that sense, right? Um, the only caveats that Blueprint can't do that like that C++ can do is that it's not necessarily fantastic if you're going to have like true, you know, down to the nanosecond calculations and stuff like that and you want things running extremely fast or you're really, really heavy on anything like processing wise, um, which is like only going to matter if you're making some high octane multiplayer game in that sense. So I mean, short of that, you should be absolutely fine, I think. Okay, Francesco made a comment that um, he doesn't have experience with Unreal Engine, but it seems much more complicated than Unity. Is it so? No, no. <laughs> well, in, yes and no, I would say, uh, if you want to be really specific about it, right? Yes and no, in the sense that it's more complicated in terms of when you first get into it, right? Because like what you're met by is all these windows and all these tools, all the places and stuff like that, and it's real easy to get over. That said, like. In Unity, by comparison, you're met with a blank slate. There's nothing there. You know, you have to make every single tool that you're going to be using in, in Unity. So, I mean, from a certain point of view, 
yes, you know, Unity seems a lot less complicated, but that's because you don't have all the extra tools and stuff like that. If you can manage to get past that initial element of being overwhelmed, those tools come in handy, right? Because you're going to save so much time if you learn Unreal over Unity. And you can make awesome things very, very quickly. Okay, uh, next question from Maya. Uh, does Unreal already have the elements to bring the world to life or does it need programming language like C++? No, it already has that. You don't necessarily need to understand C++ uh, in order to use Unreal in that sense, right? Because you have Blueprint, which is an extremely powerful scripting language. Um, You've seen me use it today with all these uh, notes. Right now, I got the uh, camera view working in the security office, by the way. Hmm. So that's actually playing live on one of the screens. So if we're looking at this, like what, what I've been working with here now, this has been very, very simple elements and stuff like that. But this is Blueprint programming um, right here. So this is a scripting language uh, that allows you to do almost anything in the game and there are actually triple a games that mostly run on this type of code like for instance there's a game called returnal um i've you know talked a lot with the lead programmer on returnal whose name is ari ambjonsson he's uh one of the lead evangelists for the unreal engine and stuff like that and you know he worked with that game uh as the lead programmer and he called me something along the lines of 80%, 80 to 90% of all the code in that game is just running in Blueprint. So it's an extremely powerful scripting language. There's plenty of resources for how to do things, and it's very, very intuitive once you actually get into it. So it kind of helps you along the way uh, for doing things. So you don't need to learn C++ in order to be an Unreal developer. It is a plus because then you can create your own code and your own Blueprint elements. But it is absolutely not necessary even to make games that you could release. Okay, Camille is asking if it's not the case that your hands are tied when it comes to modify the functions or rewrite them in Unreal Engine. No, you're not. In no way. Absolutely not. All the source code for Unreal is openly available. You can go straight down into the engine as far as you want if you want to. All of it is completely open and, uh, and available. You can dig into every single element. In no way are your hands tied. That was quick. Okay. And um, final question from Camille. Uh, what do you think is the best way to learn about modeling and level design? Well, now, level design, uh, I think those are very two different things uh, overall, actually. but. I mean, modeling, you got to pick up uh, you know, a piece of 3D software. Like, I can recommend uh, Blender. I think that's great. It's not what I personally use, but I know Blender is extremely powerful. Um, it's ridiculous, the kind of things that you can use and do in Blender. And there's a million tutorials on how to do things in Blender and stuff like that. And um, you, know, you can get going pretty quick with that. So that's what I would do. Uh, when it comes to... The level design is a little bit more of a tricky subject. Uh, let me actually change my talking head view over here. So level design is a little bit more tricky uh, subject there, but I think what you've got to do is you've got to look at environments a lot, right? You have to study environments. Like there's two different elements to it, right? Traditional level, level design used to be that you would design all the gameplay elements and you would design the environmental elements in that sense, right? Now, if you're talking about AAA games, uh, these are kind of split into two different roles, which is, you know, you got level design or, you know, level game design, and you've got environmental design, right? So the level game design is all about how the player navigates the environment and how they go about finding their objectives and stuff like that, and you manage the difficulty levels and, and, and things like that. And a really great way of learning how to do that if you don't have the resources of, say, if you go to future games, right, where we actually teach you those things. Um, if you want to try and do it on your own, I would actually take all of your favorite games, especially like where you think about the, the environments and what you really liked about them, beyond what they actually look like. Like, 
right? Because that's actually a completely secondary and not necessarily the same thing as the level design. But you take those games and you analyze them. You analyze them and you analyze them and you analyze them. Like, for instance, like what elements of this, like what, what are they trying to tell you with this environment, right? So there's a whole bunch of like psychological aspects there. There's the parts where they are guiding you towards an objective. So if it's a single player game or even a multiplayer game, actually you're funneled to a certain degree, um, which is called, you know, a lot of times like, uh, you know, foreshadowing and stuff like that, right? Because you might also have some element where you're like, you're starting out a level, what's something like that, and you'll have details which kind of like subtly point you in a certain direction. And the ways you do this is like, you use uh, light, sound, and different, you know, uh, let's see, like uh, the shapes of the environment, how they kind of funnel you into a place, and you know, the different shapes are meant to make you feel different things, like make you feel really small versus something uh, very large in the environment and such. Uh, all these like integrating architectural elements into the design to kind of make, uh, you know, commonalities of the human psyche kind of, you know, be affected by this environment and you can guide people to certain locations. Even if you have like three doors or something like that, three possible doors now, I do know that some people will always go every single door, just explore what's there. Uh, but what the environment is, is intended to do is to guide you along a certain path. Uh, so I mean, play those games, play games, analyze, figure out what makes those environments interesting and really, really, really think about it, right? That's, that's what I would do, I think. Lucy asked um, <clears throat> on which of our programs in future games we will be teaching um, uh, Unreal. Um, and I already responded, of course, it's game programming, but on other programs? All three of the core programs. That's uh, game artists, they, they touch Unreal because they work in Unreal as well. Game design works in Unreal quite a lot. And game programming also works in Unreal. They all work in Unreal. Mm -hmm. And they also all work in Unity as well. So basically, when you go to the school, you will learn all three aspects. Yeah, game design, game development, and uh, the first you mentioned, or, or, or did I misunderstood? OK, so I'll bring the microphone closer. So basically, you said uh, in the school, you will learn all three topics, the game development, yeah. Uh, the game design different programs though yeah different programs though a lot of those but yeah well, you do learn that yeah we have three programs game designer game artist and game programmer designer and artist are two years programmer two and a half years so you can choose your specialization well i'm really lacking in a design the software development i've been doing for 10 years so it's quite easy to pick up for me but and, uh, this is why i ask because actually what I find most difficult in learning online or alone uh, is that how to do things the proper way for games. Nobody explains the whole flow of creating a model, for example, for the game. Nobody explains properly uh, how to do the model proper way, how or what model should have and shouldn't have, and uh, how how much we have to optimize the model. Yeah, uh, what are the impacts of the performance on the computer? When you leave such a thing so these are like completely missed out topics when i when i was trying to learn modeling and I, mm -hmm. these are the areas i'm completely stuck in and then i think these are issues which we address in our education because that's why we want you to be on site from monday to friday to team up with other you know with designer artist programmer and create your own game under uh, guidance and mentorship of guys like tommy uh, so that you create the real stuff, optimize, you know, and correct me if That's I'm wrong, correct. but this is the idea behind future games, right? To That's correct, yeah. Yeah, I would love to join, but the, the biggest problem for me is I'm, I'm, I'm your age, yeah, so I cannot just go for two years somewhere to Warshaw and uh, not working and, <laughs> you know. It's a problem everyone has, you know, starts with that stuff. 
Yeah, but in a case when you have experience, uh, I, I think the, in Sweden, the, the things are is following that people team up, they create their own projects and they some people work and study in the same time uh, because you, you create your own workflow with your teammates during the game projects, right? So, but yeah, there, there, there are people that, who do that. Uh, once again, I didn't hear that a lot of people do that or? Tommy, what did you say at the end? I don't know. I didn't there, hear the Thomas answer. I said that there are people who work and study at the same time. I wouldn't recommend that though, because that's that's really intense because the education ex is extremely intense. I mean, it's, it's known for being very intense. Well, um, I'm a software developer. There is never stop to learning, to be honest. So I already go through Java, PHP, TypeScript, Angular. I don't know how many frameworks and technologies I have learned along the way, and there is no ending to it. So, but the question is if it's possible to to do the learning because actually I don't want to learn how to develop because actually I do understand even the modeling concepts of uh, or even I can dive into the C plus plus. But I would like to learn the other side. And if it's possible to learn in those ways, as you explained that, okay, the team up, uh, they will team, uh, the teams will team up, they will make their workflows and... I think uh, it could be useful for you, Camille, to join us tomorrow uh, on the webinar with our students where they will be presenting four of their games and they can share with you their experience, uh, how much time it takes them to really work how much time and energy they have to invest. So you're more than welcome to, to come tomorrow to our webinar. I will, can put the link into the chat. Okay, that sounds great. Uh, Lucy, Lucy has a question, so go on. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. I just want to know uh, if you have uh, on-site uh, teachers from Monday to Friday, or it's just a workshop uh from like industry leaders what's the word i would say it's it's half and half from that regard right because we we don't tend to have you know full-time teachers in the classroom from monday to friday as work well. that's not not usually what we'll do what we'll tend to do is like we'll schedule up other full days or half days and stuff like that over the weeks um, so you might have a teacher who will be an industry expert in some area who comes in and teaches for um, maybe a full day, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then after that, you'll have some kind of assignment or something you have to work on um, where you have to try it a lot of those things. And then you'll have maybe like, say, Monday, Wednesday, Friday or something like that, a particular week. And then the days between you're expected to work on your own. Mm -hmm. And uh, is there anywhere that we can find uh, the course uh, planning before we apply just to have a better view? Because it's two years, it's a big commitment. We would like to know uh, on the way what, you know, what, 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 what the detailed um, learnings we will gain during the two years. Yeah, definitely. It's on our website, so I can put it right now, the link into into our chat so it's in each of the educations you have detailed uh weekly uh, plan of education so perfect thank you very much you just uh, please click on the link which i'm sending right now and you just scroll down to education plan and there is everything um with sharing on weeks uh, how many weeks topic will take uh, the, the structure of our education is uh, resembling it's like um, uh, rooted in a swedish system where we are a part of the public educational system higher uh, vocational trainings and in poland we will reflect the same structure and we will follow the same model and we will also uh, cooperate closely with sweden so we, we will have shared collections shared workshops you know a lot of uh, tutors who are contracted right now and who are from either USA, Brazil, Turkey or, or UK. So they will be live online uh, for all our sites in Sweden and in Poland. Um, but I think uh, that the link which I gave you will be a pretty clear um, overview of 
the content of the course. Um, I'm looking for more questions. Do you guys have any more? Lucia? Yeah. Did anybody think uh, today's webinar was interesting? <laughs> yes, well, for me it is amazing. For me, definitely, I at least uh, saw how how models are being painted. Uh, more, more in a way of how to split an entity mask and stuff like that. Oh, there's one more question from Artyom, which I missed. Regarding modern AAA games, when do you think we will see Lumen and Nanite for workflows implemented in games? And what do you think about all these new possibilities? Uh, those workflows are, are already being implemented now. Okay. Um, there's absolutely no reason to believe there aren't. Uh, a lot of companies, whatever that are you, and whatever companies are using Unreal Engine 5 are going to be using those technologies right now. That was short and concrete answer. Okay. Uh, do you have any more questions? Uh, please share with us. Otherwise, we will be wrapping up. Thea, yes, go on. Yes, please do. There's one more question coming. Maybe, uh, maybe in the meantime, uh, let's go. Basically, you are not an official like a high school or something like that. Or how does it work? So, what is the end result of passing the school through, except some internship jobs and stuff like that? Yeah, um, jobs in the industry is the end goal. Yeah, getting a, direct getting a job. And uh, just, just bear in mind that th this is us who organize the internship for you. And this is integral organic part of the course. 30 weeks of internship in a game dev company. And uh, we already have established uh, working relationship with the 40 Polish game dev companies, which responded positively to our um, inquiry. And they want to uh, take our interns uh, for, for this these 30 weeks. So. In Sweden, we have uh, this um, after a uh, year and a half of uh, of the course, you have this Think uh, event where where you have matchmaking with game dev companies, and uh, you pick up the company you want to have internship at, and they pick you. So uh, we we like uh, mentor this process, and during the internship, you are also under our wings. So so we mentor you. And um, to respond like on, on, from the formal point of view, in Sweden, we are a part of a higher vocational education and you get the certificate of uh, uh, higher vocational school. In Poland, we don't have this certification. So we are basically, we're just a course, you could say. We are just at the beginning of uh, getting um, uh, accreditation as a, a studium polizialne. So after high school study. Oh, that's long, Thea. Maybe you just <laughs> um, say it loud. Uh, okay, Thea is asking, I've been working for two years as a software developer. I have a bachelor, bachelor's degree in software development from before then and before uni. I studied game programming. Right now, I'm both planning to apply to future games, but at the same time, I'm interviewing for junior game programmer positions. Tommy, do you think there are important aspects and skills I might need in the industry that I will miss out on if I go straight from software development into game development without doing future games or game assembly or similar school? That's a really interesting question, actually. Well, if you can jump right into you know the games industry without having to study for it, I think you absolutely should do it. Um, that said, a lot of what you might be missing out on is the networking aspects of being in a school like this, because 
all of your peers are going to be your future co-workers in the industry. So it's a massive contact network right there from when you, when you study. All of our teachers come from the industry, industry experts will actually come in and mentor you and teach you and stuff like that. So those are fantastic connections to have moving forward in terms of your career. Beyond that, I think a lot of the knowledge that we teach you, I mean, that should be a given, uh, the fact that you're getting expert knowledge from, you know, the biggest companies, uh, and, you know, that's kind of a crucial element there, right? Because that's, you know, it, everything that they teach you and, you know, everything like that is as up to date as we can possibly make it. So that's something you'll be missing out on if you jump straight, straight into the industry. All of those things are going to be things you pick up on your own time as you're working. Hmm. Does it sound? Yeah. Tia seems satisfied. <laughs> Thank you, Maya. Just to add, I'm not Alan, as I said at the beginning, I'm Piotr Matecki, and uh, I'm just using the account of my IT colleague here, so I'm Polish. Uh, okay, guys, I think we will be wrapping up. Thank you for today. Uh, follow us on Facebook. We will be informing about next webinars. There will be a webinar in game design as well, uh, coming after the deadline, but we want to continue with, with this series. Um, because we think it's the best way to present present ourselves uh, here in Poland and in Europe. So, so let's keep in touch. Thank you, Tommy, for today. It was amazing to to see what you can do within half an hour and a half. Yeah, what I want to say as well. Compress things a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, guys. Let's keep in touch. If you have any questions, write to us. Uh, Again, our mail in, in the chat. Any questions sent there will be answered by me or by my colleagues. So thank you very much. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.